to make sure this works. Good news. Um, first of all, I want to thank King Sport for the invitation to present here. Um, it's a pleasure to be to present amongst a host of different uh, skill sets amongst the different practitioners from physiotherapists to surgeons and different consultants. Uh, my background is a little bit different maybe to those that have already presented. Um, I come from a background of having worked in the demanding environment at the English Premier League for over 12 years, um, of which I recently came and left my uh, last club, Everton Football Club. And I'm now in the final stages of completing, not a PhD, but a professional doctorate at Liverpool John Moores University, which is around those working in applied practice and trying to give rise to new research through the applied practice and the experiences that people have had throughout that period. So that was the main aim and objective, was to help give back something to the industry that has given me a lot over 12 years and to help educate those and improve rehabilitation practices in, in, in elite football. So first of all, we're just going to touch on the, uh, return, the, the outset of Return to Sport. So this is the most recent uh, publication that was put out by the lead author, which is Claire Arden, and it looks at the Return to Sport continuum. And it's that that parallels both the recovery and rehabilitation of the athlete together, synergistically. The return to participation phase is such the athlete is operating in terms of rehabilitation and a return to on-pitch training. Then we have, as such as in, in football, which is return to play, but as in general terminology of global sports, we turn this now return to sport. And then we have the ultimate goal of the continuum, which is a return to performance of the athlete. And when we look at the literature in this area, it's very sparse, especially in elite football. There is next to nothing on a return to performance of elite athletes and elite football players. More recently, um, there was a publication by Matthew Buckthorpe at the Isokinetic Medical Group, uh, based out of Italy, um, that looked at the functional recovery process of the athlete, and he suggested that we need a sort of a movement forward towards the sort of clinical setting of rehabilitation to that of the applied setting of moving back towards a return to performance and a return to sport on the pitch environment. And it said, suggested that there needs to be amalgamation between that clinical setting, on-field rehabilitation, a return to training, a return to competition, and ultimately a return to performance of the athlete. But what about, what about return to sport after ACL injuries? So... Currently, there's so much research out there in the field regarding ACL injuries, regarding return to sport criteria, and ultimately, there's still no optimal consensus regarding the best rehab processes. And there's some research that may suggest that for athletes, it may not be safe to return for up to two years. That's a completely safe return. But in the environment that I've just come from, working in elite football, where it's a process of risk management, ultimately, there's a high high demand for money and success in elite football. Ultimately, that risk management is about balancing the goals of the team, which is ultimately success, which may be challenging for the top competition places or staying in the league, and that of the health of the athlete. So it's a risk and reward. It's about balancing that, about how can we get the player back safely, effectively, return them to sport, moving towards a return to performance, whilst also maintaining and managing the health of the athlete. And moving from those initial return to sport consensus statement, which was back in 2002 by Herring and six um, sports medical associations, the return to sport publication in 2016 also touched on that the return to sport is now a shared decision-making process, as such that all the key stakeholders are involved, the players involved, and they help to facilitate the optimal outcome of returning the player back into sporting competition. Moving back onto the return to sport criteria. So there's so much literature out there regarding return to sport criteria around the area of functional testing. And one of the, there was an interesting publication by Polita Blanche and uh, Tim Gabbert a few years ago, I think it was 2016, that brought about this concept as have the athlete actually trained enough of the, actually, of the athlete's sport to go back into competition? Can they handle the demands of competition? My experience of this is, from rehabilitation of 12 years is when you look at the traditional state of rehabilitation, movement in and out of cones is far and away the demands of the elite football environment 
it doesn't mirror that environment at all, yet we throw a player back in because he achieves the markers on a bit of functional testing. And for me, it doesn't quite cut it. And for that, it's about how do we quantify if an athlete's trained enough? Well, in elite football now, and in a lot of elite sporting organisations, the use of GPS is profound. And there is some questions regarding some of the reliability and validity of that, especially moving at high speeds. But there is a lot of publications that suggest that it is a valid and reliable marker of an athlete's ability to perform training. There was also a publication that came out uh, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2018, by Stairs in Australia, which was Aussie Rules Football, which also found that if we extend an athlete's rehabilitation and perform enough rehabilitation load, as in what should compose of distance, high-speed running, explosive movements, compared to what the athlete was like prior to injury, there was actually a reduced risk of re-injury when the athlete went back in. So it also highlights an important point of has the athlete done enough of his training environments? So the key of my professional doctorate is around constructing an effective framework for return to sport in elite football. And as part of this, the first stage was, what is a conceptual framework? What does it do? It takes not just one theory, it's, it's, it looks at taking multiple interrelated theories and put them together to construct new, a new framework that can help guide practice. And the first one I've highlighted in grey, because it doesn't, it doesn't really integrate in the framework. It refers to sort of the physical preparation prior to returning to on-pitch running. And it's about, can we optimally load the structures and the tissues to maximise physical adaptation and look into for the mechanisms of what are involved in the sport? Doing training, doing exercise, just doesn't cut it at the highest level. We have to expose the athlete to the right type of training. But when I look to put this framework together, the key concepts that we look to include are first, the quantification of load. So how can we quantify whether the athlete is trained enough? So the perfect measure that we use within the elite environment is global positioning systems. And players are tracked daily. We use, some, in some match situations, we use optical data, where I've done a study that compares tr um, optical data and GPS to compare the two, if we're going to match apple to apple. Then we also need to look at energy system conditioning and physically preparing the player for the demands of the sport. And how can we look to integrate that from day one on the grass to, the, to when they return to the team training environment? What are the concepts we need to include? Then, as was mentioned, I think Dustin mentioned it earlier about the ecological validity, is about periodization of training. Day one on the grass doesn't mimic the team training environment, but we need to move to an environment that tries to match the periodization structure that is suitable for football and the environment that how the team trains, where nowadays that can be a three, a four, even a five day lead in going into match day. So if we go take a player back into sport and they've only trained three days in a week, it's not, it's not preparing them for the demands of the sport. We also need to consider the sport-specific skills of football that we can't actually quantify using global positioning systems. So shooting, passing, kicking, tackling, they're also important contributions that need to be considered and how we integrate them in terms of the return to sport process. And then more importantly, load is load. We can run up and down in straight lines all day. But we need to also think about the qualitative nature of sport in competition. It's, it's reactive. It's an anticipated, it's spontaneous. We don't know what's going to happen. So we need to try and recreate that environment, hence the link to some of Dustin's work. Uh, and that's what we try to do is in terms of the framework. So how do we try to integrate that qualitative nature? So this is looking at uh, Newell's constraints model, which was back in, I think it was 18, 1986. And it looked at interaction between different types of constraints, predominantly looking from our point of view, the task and environmental constraints, and how we can tailor the learning environment of the athlete that dictates the amount of control to chaos on the athlete, which will ultimately increase the neurocognitive and perceptual learning of the athlete, which is also integrated with the running load that we're gonna expose them to, returning them back to their pre-injury chronic loads, if that's our goal, it may be beyond that. Because sometimes in football managers, tenature can only be one to two years. The goal might be pushed beyond that. So we have to consider what all these different considerations, potentially what the athlete is going to be required to do. 
That's why I always preach at these things. Think about this as we have this framework in place, but we need to not just think about a set protocol, we need to think about considerations. There are many different challenges that can present themselves in elite environments. So how does this look? So high control and moderate control are the return to running phases. So is, is the athlete capable of running in a straight line of a linear nature? And how can we put a level of energy system conditioning on that, low level aerobic conditioning? So this would consist of a box to box run. This is just an example where the athlete would require to run from box to the box in 16 seconds with a 14 second active recovery for the end of the penalty area and back. The athlete will, produce, uh, will perform a set number of repetitions of this, which will normally start from around three minutes, building up to four minutes. And we work up to a progression of four blocks, three blocks of six, which would give us three times four minute blocks. So we're starting to build in different facets. We're building in the running load, we're building the aerobic conditioning, but we're also controlling the session. The next phase, second phase of return to running, is starting to move towards adding con control change of direction, including the ball, which will increase the motivation of the player to perform the session. And we're starting to again progress the demands as we increase the ball. We know that the, the strain on the heart will go up. So, and this will be a block of intermittent running lanes, which will different, the task can be controlled by the, the distances that we place in between the markers. And ultimately, we can start to progress different facets of load, such as high speed running, by giving them set uh, time targets to achieve set distances. And ultimately, throughout this process, we're getting real time feedback from the GPS systems now, where there's, there's excellent uh, real time to download data showing consistency. The next phase is the most, one of the most important phases. So we start to enter the football Pacific conditioning phases. So this is where we move from intensive and extensive football. So intensive football is renowned for working tight, restricted spaces. And extensive football is opening out into wider spaces, achieving those high speed running and sprint distances. What we know when we start to run at high speeds, we have greater musculoskeletal demands, particularly on the hamstring. As that goes up, the, the demands upon the bicep femoris goes up, which we have to then be wary of potential spikes in inverted copper in running certain running load, which have been shown to be associated with certain types of injury. So the last thing we want is to get the player back on the pitch and suffer a further sex back and another injury. So we have to be wary about the type, um, the amount of running load we place on the athlete any one time. Is that third video playing? So the examples here are not the whole session. These are certain drills within a sub-session. So the control to chaos phase there is a positional acceleration drill for a centre half. So it's a certain number of repetitions, three times six, with high work rest recovery in a specific nature as the player is moving in response to reactive nature onto the ball. We then move into the moderate control zone, moderate chaos zone, where we're starting to look at integrating our speed and speed endurance conditioning. Again, increasing the perceptual and neurocognitive demands of the ball. We're trying to interact more players in the environment. And obviously, the demands in terms of the running load are starting to progress, and we're nearly re uh, reaching chronic load for the player. And as we enter that last phase, is where we start to implement worst case scenario drills, and drills that are actually trying to mimic potentially how the athlete got injured, which ultimately has an important uh, facets to improve the confidence of the player going back into the sport. So this involves, also involves conditioning that player in states of fatigue if required. Again, the considerations is important. So we're actually trying to condition the player not to meet just the running demands, but also the demands of that player's position. So collectively, what does that look like? So we have the control chaos continuum. It moves from high control to high chaos, it gradually increasing and improving perceptual and neurocognitive demands, whilst also interlinking GPS performing performance variables to return the athlete back to their chronic load demands prior to injury. But for ACL injuries, what does that mean? So how, what, do we, what do we need to monitor what do we, on the pitch? What do we need to be wary of in terms of some of those running load demands? So we need to think about progression of running volumes. In the early stages, is the knee capable of handling the, muscus, the demands that are put through the joint through running? 
If it's not, normally there'll be a response, a load response, so signs of effusion and swelling. So we need to be cautious about this. How can we progress through the stages? So here we have examples on the right-hand side of objective strength and power diagnostics that can help inform the return to sport process and make sure the athlete is ready to move through the phases and meeting certain criteria to, alongside being pain-free and free of effusion to make progression towards progression of their running loads. So it's collectively bringing all these bits of information and considerations together to help inform our return to sport decision. Is the athlete ready to go back into the mounds of sport? So there we have a periodization examples of these different phases. So the first, first graph on the left hand shows, shows the return to running phases. So high control, moderate control. So obviously we look at progressions of running low demands. In these early phases it will be total distance, which are around 35% of an athlete's gain, gain load, which will be around three to three and a half thousand meters. Which if an athlete is to do three sessions of that in a week, you're looking at nine and a half to 10,000 meters of total distance within the week which athletes, depending on the environment, could be anything between 25 and 40 kilometers in a week. But that's given us a stepping stone, a foundation, as long as the athlete is pain-free and, free and, fr and the joint is free of effusion. It's a foundation. Once, we have, which we, once we're confident, which in some case examples, which I'll show you in a minute, of a, of a female athlete we recently returned to sport and onto a level of performance that we'll go on to, is that the period that an athlete may stay in this period of return to running may be up to four weeks. Because remember, they might have been absent from on-pitch activity for up to six months. So why are we in immediate phase on the pitch to get them straight back to change in direction, which has high demands upon the joint? We then enter those football-specific phases. So it starts to, to integrate intensive and extensive football, each of the two interacting to complement each other. So obviously, we have one type of demand on one day, followed by another demand, followed by a period of recovery in between. So we could look at to four sessions during that week, and if need be, if we need to return the athlete back to more sessions on the grass at five days, we can opt in an on-pitch active recovery session, which we might be just working on some technical aspects to develop. And then, how do we interact those technical aspects? So this is taken from a Impress piece in the Aspartar Sports Medicine Journal that's to come out in the next couple of months. So how do we integrate these technical skills? So in the early phases, high control, there's going to be minimal technical involvement with the ball. So keep your ears, little touches, get some little encouragement that they're back on the grass, increasing confidence. And then we start to interact some of the other technical skills, short range, short range passing in low volume. We're going to minimise the shooting because we don't want any um, bad rec fem strains during early rehabilitation when they've only just got back on the grass. Jumping and heading static in low volume. And then we're building it up through the phases. So then we go control chaos, short mid-ray passing, moderate low volume. We're progressive. We can't monitor this in terms of technology at the moment, but we can use traditional notational analysis to know how we're integrating these technical actions back into our play. So we're looking at the running load, we're looking at the sport specific skills, but we're also looking at trying to challenge the athlete in the positional specific demands in terms of improving the perceptual and the cognitive demands placed on the athlete. And then what does that look like? This is just an example from the editorial in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, looking how we to return our athlete to chronic load. So we take the concurrent load, which is taken within a week, what the athlete performs in a match and training total, and then the training demands. And then we need to think about what are we taking the athlete back into? Are we taking them above concurrent load? Are we taking them in between concurrent and training load? That's then our target to then work towards. And then the medical team will give us a phase diagnostic of how long that player is going to be out for. And that's bringing back to working within an interdisciplinary team within this environment. We take the information from the relevant stakeholder and we use that information to guide the athlete's recovery. So where does this fit in Claire Arden's return to sport continuum? So the control chaos continuum fits within the return to participation phase, as in the athlete is returned to on-pitch running, but is not at their previous level performance. So when they return to sport, so they go back into team training, what happens then? Do we just throw them back in and hope for the best? Well, maybe, but probably not the best thing to do when an athlete's probably been out for uh, probably nine months normally for an ACL case if, if it's all gone well. 
So we need to think about something else. So we need to think about our return to performance, but what does a return to performance look like? So in the absence of any literature in this area, I thought I'd have a go at trying to create some. So we're trying to perform typical match outputs. So what was the athlete like pre-injury, considering they might be playing in the same position? How we, are they creating those level of outputs in games, monitored either using optical or GPS technology, depending on what we have? Are they able to handle the concurrent loads of both training and match play? Are they pain-free? Is the joint through of a fusion? Importantly, so I think, are they displaying pre-injury traits? So working with a coach, working with, working with a video analysis team, are they re-performing those movements they were prior to injury? And then, ultimately, does the coach have confidence that player's back to a level of to return to sport and then back to performance? Because if the player's being picked to play, which might be a progressive return to match minutes, and the player builds up 90 minutes, 90 minutes, 90 minutes in the bank, with their running loads being monitored throughout this period, ultimately the coach is confident that that player is returning to a level of performance to play in. So to help guide the next phase after return to sport, we've, we've put together a return to performance framework to, to gradually introduce a player back into the training environment. So we have return to train, non-contact, return to train, contact, return to train, full integration, moving to return to competition, progressive match minutes exposure, and then a return to performance. And then we're looking again, what does the team training structure like, look like? How can we integrate them within those phases? How long are they in that phase? Don't know. That's based on the considerations of that individual athlete. I don't know what any, every individual athlete is going to be like. I don't know the pressure from the management. Does that, is that player a key player? Do we need to get them back ASAP? There's so many different things can influence decision making. But why did we integrate this? So, in that return to sport phase, when the player goes back into training environment, we see an even greater neurocognitive load on the player. And for that, there's a period of re-adaptation that's required. When you've got, when you go from a training environment in rehab where you might have two, three, which might not be players, which might be support staff, in and around you, it's very different when you're training with a full team which might be 24 players. That's significantly stressful. Well, I can imagine it is on the brain. And when you look at some of the load markers in this period, when you look at the relationship between the external load and the internal load, as in, in rehab, the external running load might be a set level, but then they're, they're, they're coping internally. But when you throw them back into the team training, when you've got the interaction of 24 players in and around you, the internal response to the external load goes through the roof, which is a stressful occasion. So how can we best manage that? So in that intensive and extensive football model, we can reintegrate the player as a floater, which is a spare person within a game, whether that's intensive or extensive. We can put them on the outside, which is probably the best option as the first method of integration. We can use rotations in full integration, so they might be a spare in one game, as in a full involvement in the second game. So we're gradually drip feeding greater neurocognitive load on the player, whilst also monitoring their running load at the same time. We can control their touch conditions, which is a task constraint. We can have underloads or overloads, as in it might be a 5v3, where they're on the 5 reducing the cognitive load. Next game, they might be in the three rather than the five. So there's an overall greater stress on that player. There's many different strategies to stress the, tr the player in this environment. And ultimately, pitch dim dimensions is probably the most common one. And then how do we look at that energy system development? Taking some of the concepts from strength and conditioning here, straight sets, pyramid loading, alternate loading, ways that will, will induce cha changes in density and intensity of the session. How we can change that. And then obviously, one of the big things when these players go back and now in an elite environment is the phase of the season we're in. If it's the Christmas period, where teams are train, playing games every three days, it's going to be very difficult sometimes to manage that player's load because the team isn't going to be training. So we might have to do additional top-up work, individual work, to keep that athlete's running load stable. As we know, fluctu huge fluctuations and spikes in running load are cause potential concern, potential injury risk. So we need to monitor the external and the internal responses to that load throughout progression. How do we look at that in terms of periodization models? So in the first return to train phases, we obviously have, they would normally involved in the non-starters training after the recovery session on the Sunday. 
where there'll be more technical and tactical element. And then they'll go into that model of in intensive football, small-sided games, and extensive football in that two acquisition days. And then we can have a period of recovery before they ramp. And then they go into a top-up session when, they d when the team are playing. And then we go into that return to competition, return to performance phase, where they reintroduce to the full training model of the team, having two acquisition days for a, by a two-day taper going into match day. And this is just reflective of global looking at that tactical per periodization paradigm. But many different managers will train in very different ways, from my experience. But how does it all fit together then? So we have this return to sport continuum, where we have return to participation, return to sport, and return to performance. So we've then put together the control chaos continuum to guide a return to sport, thinking about the increasing perceptual and neurocognitive demands, the running load demands, returning the athlete to chronic load. And then we have a gradual period of reintroduction to team training, a return to competitive match minutes, which is progressive, and then moving towards a return to performance. But how does this look in a case example? So this is a case example that we currently have under review in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. So this is looking at that whole framework of when the player gets injured, not months, and then handling in early physiotherapy care. And then move into the sports sciences realm where we look at between four and six months at that period of optimal and progressive loading. Where there's a combination of isometric and jump landing preparation, dynamic strength and some blood flow resistance training. And then a return to anti-gravity treadmill running, which is monitored at the bottom by our strength and power diagnostics, counter movement jump, firstly a submax to give us an idea of where the player's at and how they're able to handle load. And then multiple counter movement jump measures throughout the whole return to sport process, which is also supported by mid-thigh pull, isometric posterior chain, hip strength, and DEXA scores to give us a global measure of where that player's at. Those measures give us inform our clinical reasoning to make progressions throughout return to sport. We then progress the loading further to tackle the deficits that we've discovered from our diagnostic testing. Once the player's at a level to return to on-patch activity, the player follows the return to the control chaos continuum to return that athlete to chronic load. And obviously at that point, at nine and a half months, the athlete sees the surgeon, which they're given the traditional discharge. The player meets his ret the return to sport criteria that we set, which was a return to chronic load, meeting limb strength asymmetry index on the isoclastic dynamometer. So the, the traditional return to sport measures that we put in place. And then we went through a phase return to, to sport. So we integrated the return to performance framework and moved that player towards a return to performance. And then we can see the running load demands for the whole process. So following the player from all the way through from day one on the grass, all the way through to her last game at the FIFA Women's World Cup, using the same global positioning technology all the way through the process, showing that how we progressively got the player back to a chronic load, and now how, she, how her load was stabilized throughout that process in order to meet the demands of what she's gonna face during two games in the week at the FIFA World Cup. And how do we look at some measures of where the athlete's back to a level of performance? Well, we looked at some of her running load within games. And importantly, within Stadia, we'd look at the satellite da data. So we take the H-dot with the horizontal dilution of precision, which below one gives us a, a military grade of score. And then we have a minimum number of satellites that we need connected to of two to, to take our data as high quality, to have confidence it's good data. We can't just take that data. We can't assume it's good data. We need to check it for ir irregularities of delayed detection of locomotion. So we can't just take it for what it is on the surface. So also looking at match interpretation, we need to see. But the athlete showed signs of return to performance. And then in the f what we have, what I haven't got time to show you, is some video data showing the player performing atypical measures that she did prior, prior to injury. So to summarize, we have the return to sport continuum, where the athletes are return to participation, return to sport, and then a return to performance. But what do we need to consider? We need to consider optimal loading, sport-specific preparation for the demands of the sport, and a return to pre-injury loads. Part of this, we produce the control chaos continuum to help guide practitioners in elite football, which we hope will be able to help develop this within other sports outside of football as well. And then beyond that, we have the return to performance framework, which was helped to
guide, a gradual return to team training environment, a return to match minutes, and then a return to competition. But with any rehab, it's best served by a combination of clinical reasoning, why are you doing something? Objective data that confirms why you're doing something and backs up why you're going to move forward and progress. And secondly, you take all the information from the key stakeholders concerned in a shared decision-making process. Thank you for your time, everyone.